All the glory to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus, somebody. I want to welcome you to church. It's going to be a great time in the presence of the Lord. I'm asking you to pull your expectations and pull your faith over to the table so we can have a good time together in the presence of the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome to church. Hallelujah. This is Church at Hero Smart, and Hero Smart is a ministry set up by God for the discipleship of the nations in keeping with Jesus' instruction in Matthew chapter 28, which says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you to do. And lo, I will be with you till the end of the age. Hallelujah. And in trying to keep with that instruction in this ministry, God has given us an opportunity to create a set of studies through which we can do that very well. And that's the, that set of studies is what we've called the Online Discipleship Program, or the ODP in short. And the Online Discipleship Program may be sectioned to four major categories. There's a part of it that we call the Pharmacy Section of the Word, another part we call the Milk Section of the Word, the Meat Section of the Word, and the Water Section of the Word of God. And in coming through the 2019 session of the ODP, God has given us the privilege to come through the pharmacy section of the word, the milk section of the word, and we are right now in the meat category of the word of God. Um, and we started the meat aspect of the word of God about four weeks ago with the first series of messages over there that we titled Spiritual Groceries. Hallelujah. If you haven't gotten a chance to listen to those messages, there are four messages in that that particular series of the Word of God. We titled it Spiritual Groceries to give mature believers the uh, spiritual education to know what their spiritual systems are telling them, telling them to be able to respond appropriately to the spiritual stimuli of their spiritual systems. And as you grow up in things of the Spirit, I believe that study is going to be really important for you so you can know how to respond intelligently to the thirst stimulus, to the milk stimulus, to the meat stimulus, and subsequently starting to pass that spiritual legacies on to your friends and brothers and sisters all over the world to make the disciples of all nations and build up credit for yourself of turning people closer to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So I will, I will, I will recommend that um, anybody who hasn't listened to that Please make sure you avail yourself of that. Um, today, we are going to start another series of the main section of the Word of God that we've titled The Faith of a Priest. Hallelujah. The Faith of a Priest is what we are going to be talking about today, and it is a meat aspect of the Word of God. And how do we know that the, the faith of a priest is going to be a meat aspect of the Word of God? I'm going to ask you, please turn to Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to try to get started with that uh, particular chapter of the Bible because it gives us a little tip into what will pass as meet studies of the Word of God and operating as a, as a priest of the New Testament actually centers on the meat of the Word of God or the meat of the Word of God centers on operating like a priest of the New Testament. So we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 5 right now and we are going to start to read from verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 5. If you've got a paper copy of the Bible, please bookmark this particular chapter. It's really, really going to be important to understand what the meat section of the Word of God is going to be all about. Hebrews chapter 5. It says, Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weaknesses. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he, said, he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and supplications with strong cries and tears to, to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because he feared. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who will obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. 
So it's trying to talk about and preach the ministry of Jesus when it was here over 2,000 years ago. And then he goes on in verse 11 and says, We have much to say about this. About what? About the priestly aspect of Jesus' ministry. But it is hard to explain because you guys are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. And anyone who still lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil. So if you read that passage of scripture, Hebrews chapter 5, from verse 1 till the end of that chapter, with a little bit of honesty, you'll appreciate that what God is trying to get, get Paul or the writer of the book of Hebrews, the document for us, is to meet section of the word of God is going to be Jesus' priestly ministry. And incidentally, Jesus' priestly ministry is going to be your priestly ministry as well. Why? Because you've been called to be kings, to be a king and a priest in Christ Jesus. Which scripture says that? First Peter chapter 2. Let's turn to that. So, well, that priest of ministry is just going to be for Jesus. It's not my business. No, it is your business. A whole lot your business on this side of eternity. If you want to function as a true, true king in Christ Jesus, you've got to appreciate what it means to be a priest in Christ Jesus as well. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 2 and in verse 9 it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. The word of God calls you a royal priesthood. What that's, that's letting you know is that there is royalty associated with your ministry on this side of eternity. And there is a priestly aspect of your ministry as well. So kings and priests, that's who you are. That's who I am in the body of Christ. Another scripture that is going to be worthy of note is going to be Revelation chapter 1. Which talks about the fact that God has called us to be kings and priests so that we can serve God. Revelation chapter 1 and in verse 5 to verse 6 it says to him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be kings and priests to serve God and the Father to him be glory forever and ever hallelujah so that's another passage of scripture that lets us know that the believer has been commissioned not only to be a king in Christ Jesus, but you've been commissioned to be a king, to be a priest in Christ Jesus as well. So it's not going to be just appropriate for you to appreciate the kingship aspect of your ministry. Is it appropriate for you to appreciate the kingship aspect of your ministry? Of course it is appropriate. You are a king in Christ Jesus. You shall stand in your God-given authority. That's what it means to be a king in Christ Jesus, to issue orders and to expect that your orders will come to pass in the realm of the natural. God's giving you that privilege. He's giving you a name. I'm giving you a name that is above all names. Jesus talked about that. That's the kingship aspect of your ministry. To pray prayers. To speak words that will be adhered to. In the realm of the spirit. In the realm of the, of the natural. So that you can be a true Greek king in Christ Jesus. But what's going to support that kingship operation is the priestly aspect of your ministry, which is documented here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, in 1 Peter 2, 9, and by extension of what was documented of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 5. And incidentally, all through the Old Testament, that's been the plan of God all the while. If you read through the book of Exodus, you're going to see that originally God intended for the nation of Israel to be a collection of kings and priests to serve him. God never had in mind to have the kingship ministry separated from the priestly ministry. Uh, when the people of Israel started making the idea of separating the kingship ministry from the priesthood ministry, they wanted to start behaving like the heathen nations they were surrounded by. They started getting in trouble because of that. God's plan all the while is to have the king to be their priest, to have the priest to be their king. And that's the reason Moses was their king and at the same time was their priest, because he was the most spiritual person in that vicinity, in that dispensation. Joshua was their king and at the same time was their priest. Up until the time of Samuel, Samuel was their king and at the same time was their priest. Eli was their king and at the same time was their priest. The nation of Israel was not ruled like other nations all around the world. The most spiritual person, the one who could hear from God clearly, was given their instructions and leading them. Samuel, Moses, Joshua, Eli, all those guys were their kings and at the same time were their priests. 
But when the nation of Israel started getting indignant and they said, no, 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 we, we don't want, we don't want this kind of, we want to be like the heathen nations so, that we are surrounded by. Separate the kingship ministry from the priesthood ministry. Let the priests stay preaching over there in the backside. Let's give us a king, a man of stature who can lead us to war. And God told them, well, that's not a smart idea from you guys because the king that you're going to set over you is going to make you go in the direction of carnality. And they said, no, we don't want to listen to that. Just give us a king. And then God gave them Saul. And Saul, after Saul, there was David. And they just spiraled down all the way right from, right from there. Not the plan of God at all. The most spiritual person should be the king and at the same time should be a priest. Hallelujah. That's the plan of God and that is still the plan of God in the New Testament. And in your life as an individual on this side of eternity, you need to start thinking about both ministries. Hallelujah. That's what this faith of a priest is going to try to teach us today. Hallelujah. Starting from today. So it is appropriate, it is important for you to appreciate the priestly aspect of your ministry, which the priestly aspect of your ministry will be the spiritual implications. Hallelujah of the priestly ceremonies and priestly services that God documented in the book of Exodus, starting from Exodus chapter 25 up until chapter 40, and which Jesus, Yahushua, operated at the spiritual implications of those ceremonies 2,000 years ago when he was walking here. Hallelujah. Because how many people know that Yahushua was not from the tribe of Levi? He came from the tribe of Judah. So naturally speaking, they are not, they did not allow him into the temple to offer gifts and sacrifices like a regular priest. priest. But Yahushua operated the spiritual implications of those gifts and sacrifices that Moses commanded them to operate 2,000 years ago. And he functioned like a priest of the heavenly tabernacle, even though they didn't open the doors for him in the physical tabernacle to do that. Why? Because he was from the tribe of Judah. But nonetheless, he is still function as a priest of the New Testament, of the heavenly tabernacle, rather. Which scripture says that? Hebrews chapter 5. In the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplications with strong cries and tears. So he who was able to save his soul from death and was hurt because of fear. He functioned like a priest of the New Testament, of the heavenly tabernacle, to give us a little tip, to give us an opportunity to understand that we need to function like that as well in the New Testament. Why is it important to fulfill the spiritual implications of the instructions of the tabernacle of Moses? The reason it's important to start thinking about this is because this is the way to consistent manifestation of the glory of God in your life. Especially as you grow up right now from being a baby. Right now you are going to start, uh, you, 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 there, there are certain deposits on the, on the inside of you. That you've gone up all the while as you've been through the milk study of the Word of God. You've been through the pharmacy section of the Word of God. You've been through the milk study of the Word of God. God's deposited certain things into you right now that you want to start passing across to other people in your world as priests of the heavenly tabernacle. Why do we need to operate like priests in the New Testament? So that we can be true kings in Christ Jesus. So that our lives can be filled with the glory of God. How do we know that? Now let's turn to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. And I'm going to start to read from verse 34. Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34 says, Then the cloud covered the tents of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses could not enter the tents of the meeting because the cloud had settled it, settled over it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Hallelujah. Now the reason the cloud settled over the tents of the meeting, the glory of the Lord filled the tents of the meeting, was because Moses built all the while according to the pattern that was shown Moses on the mountain. Let's look at that instruction. God had already given them an instruction. Exodus chapter 25. He told Moses, make sure you build everything I'm telling you. In Exodus chapter 25 in verse 9, it says, Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern that I will show you on the mountain. And God took Moses up to the mountain, showed him the, the dimensions of the tabernacle, showed him the ceremonies over there. This is the outer court in here. This is the holy place. This is the most holy place. And go down the mountain, make sure you replicate all that. And Moses said, yes, sir. 
So they took all the instructions that God gave them down the mountain, and then they started replicating the tabernacle of Moses right from Exodus chapter 25 up until chapter 40. Then in chapter 40, the word of God says this is the grand finale. When everything was completed, they did everything just like God told them to do. They built the outer core. They put the holy place in there, the most holy place. They put the, the articles of worship into those rooms of the tabernacle of Moses. The word of God says the glory of the Lord descended on the tabernacle. Guess what? If you build your lives with the spiritual implications of the tabernacle of Moses as well, you are going to see the glory of the Lord descending on your circumstances. And that's what we want, because that's what Jesus did. And that's what Yahushua had as his experience 2,000 years ago. He patterned his operations after the tabernacle of Moses. Not the physical tabernacle of Moses, but the spiritual implications of the tabernacle of Moses. How do we know that the spiritual implication of the tabernacle of Moses is what God is going to be interested in right now. The Word of God says in John chapter 4 that God is spirit and let those who worship Him worship Him in spirit and in truth. Let's see, let's see right now in John chapter 4 and verse 21, Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You're not going to be going to that physical tabernacle anymore, woman, believe me. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet the time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let us know that what God is really interested in will be the spiritual implications of those instructions that God gave them back in the tabernacle of Moses. Yahushua tells this woman over here, believe me, woman, there's going to come a time when this physical temple, this physical tabernacle, which is filled with the outer court articles, the holy place articles, the most holy place articles, are not going to be needed anymore. Why? Because what God really wants is the spiritual implications of those physical temples. They built a tabernacle firstly, then they built the temple of Solomon, and it was destroyed. They built the temple of Zerubbabel, they put all these buildings together. God said, well, all those physical things are not really what I want. What I want is the spiritual lessons that those physical symbolisms will teach you. But nonetheless, those physical things, those physical ceremonies, should give you shadows of the operations of your spiritual ceremonies right now. Now, those spiritual ceremonies are what we are going to try to get started with today in what I call the faith of a priest. And if we fulfill the spiritual ceremonies, and we trust God to open our eyes to see the implication of the outer core, to see the implication of the holy place, the most of the place, to see the implication of the brazen altar, the brazen labor, to see the implication of the altar of incense, the table of his presence, to see the, the implication of the lampstand, the mercy seat, and all those articles in the tabernacle of Moses, we are going to have the same kind of testimony that Moses had in Exodus chapter 40. When we build our lives, you build your prayer life, you build your operation, you build everything you are doing after the tabernacle of Moses as a priest of the New Testament, you are going to see the glory of the Lord descending on your circumstances. What are we talking about? The glory of the Lord descending in circumstances. We are going to see amplified manifestation of supernatural actions. Are we going to be seeing literal physical clouds and thunder strikes all around your house and all over your car? Not necessarily. That's not what we need. But we want to have the testimony of Yahushua back in the Gospels. When Jesus said, I thank you, Lord, because you always hear my prayers. Yahushua says, anytime I pray, my father hears my prayer. Well, I want that to be my testimony as well. Why? Because I'm tired of praying prayers that are not going to be answered. I'm tired of seeing the devil walk into my circumstances and walk out anytime he wants to do that. No, that's not a covenant. I signed with my God. My God says, I'm going to be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. And everything I lay my hands on to do, I need to prosper in it. If I'm not prosper, I want to know why. I want to know the why of why. 
And I want to have the testimony of Jesus back in the gospel so I can say, my father, here's Lonre Lune every time, 24-7, when he prays. I want to structure my life based on the tabernacle of Moses, the spiritual implications therein, so that I can have the testimony of Jesus. And I'm calling in the study along with me to understand how can I fill my life with the glory of God. Open my eyes, Father. Just like Jesus said over here, the time is coming for the true worshipers to serve in a heavenly tabernacle in the spirit. I want to enlist in the service. Jesus, open my eyes and give me hearing ears, understanding, or put salve on my eyes and stop my dead ears. Let me see clearly. Jesus, open my eyes. Let's pray that prayer. Say, Father, open my eyes. Let me see clearly in the name of Jesus. Cry out and come. Hallelujah. So that's what this series of messages will try to try to uh, undo for by the grace of God. Now title it The Faith of a Priest Part 1. We are going to be going through that. So we're going to get started right now with the faith of a priest. And the faith of a priest will be the, 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 the spiritual implications of the ceremonies of the tabernacle of Moses. And those spiritual implications God has helped us all through the years to put it together in a concatenation of seven, seven principles of faith, which I am going to just list out right now to you. And I'll, I'm going to show you the scriptural basis for those actions. But if you're taking notes, you're welcome just to write it down right now. A concatenation of complete exercise of faith principles, which will pass as the operation of priests in the heavenly tabernacle, will be repentance and loading. Number one, desiring the word. Number two, praying the word. Number three, believing the word. Number four, uh, number five, confessing the word. And then number six, meditating the word. And number seven, doing corresponding physical actions based on what you downloaded from the mercy seat. So those are going to be the seven principles, complete operation of faith principles, which are a concatenation of principles that we can see from the New Testament scriptures, from Old Testament scriptures. In prior years, we've called these series of teachings, the art and science of prayer. But so starting from last year, we, we started calling it um, the faith of a priest. Why? Because it is not appropriate for you just to talk about prayer in isolation. And I've said that multiple times, and you, you need to start appreciating that. When you're thinking of prayer, do not just think about prayer in isolation. Think about certain things that you need to do prior to your praying. Think about what you need to do while you're praying. Think about what you need to do even after you pray. Why? Because there are certain things you need to do prior to praying so you can pray effectively and fervently. And after you pray, there are certain things you need to do so that you can receive what you prayed for. So it's not going to be appropriate for you to talk about prayer in isolation. Because if you talk about prayer in isolation... And all you tell people is to pray, 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 pray. They are going to get mechanical with that effort. Their prayer lives are going to be boring and dry because they are not building according to the pattern that God showed Moses in the mountain. God did not tell Moses just to offer up incense in the holy place to where the most holy place. No. He told Moses, you got to do certain things in the outer court. You got to put on your garment of ordination. You got to wash your hands and wash your feet. You got to put incense in your censer. You need to do certain spiritual ceremonies before you go over there and start to offer up incense before me to the most total place. How come God didn't just tell Moses, carry, carry spices in your censer, march straight into the most total place and start offering up incense? No, God didn't do that. But why are we telling people all you need to do is to pray, 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 pray? In the New Testament, wrong. We're talking about precision operation right now so you can see the glory of the Lord is documented in Exodus chapter 40 in your circumstances. So it is not going to be appropriate to talk about prayer in isolation. Do not just emphasize prayer. Is prayer important? Of course it's important. But so is desiring the word. So is repenting and loading your spirits with Zoe's scriptures and Zoe's spices. So is believing the word. So is confessing the word. So is meditating the word. So is doing the word. All these things are the exercise of faith principles. Complete exercise of faith principles which will make you operate like gold even in a season of darkness. So when the fire gets really hot and God places you in the furnace of fire, you can shine through. Why? Because your exercise of faith principles are complete right now. And the harder the fire gets, 
the more glorious you turn out. Why? Because your faith principles are like gold and not like silver. We talked about that in the book study of the Word of God. That incomplete exercise of faith principles will be like silver. Some of our brothers, the only thing they talk about is believe, confess, meditate, do. You're like silver. Some of our brothers, the only things they talk about is pray, 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 pray. You're like silver as well. And when the heat of the fire really gets really hot, you are not going to be able to pass unscathed. You are going to be burned a little bit. What does it mean to be burned? You're going to get offended out of the Lord. You're going to wonder why, why is this thing not working? I'm just going to, you start cursing God in the back of your heart, under your breath. You get burned already because you're not complete in your operation of faith principles. Learn today from the faith of a priest. Believe God for revelation to open your eyes to see the spiritual implication of the tabernacle of Moses and study along with us. Glory to God. So how did we come through, come to understand the complete concatenation of faith principles and talking about? Let's turn to Mark chapter 11 right now. In Mark chapter 11, the word of God says in verse 23 and 24, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive it. Now, I'm going to read it right now from the NIV for, firstly. It says, I tell you the truth, if any of you says to this mountain, go through yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. So our, our fathers in the past have used that passage of scripture to talk about the concept of faith. And I think that passage of scripture is appropriate. It's really relevant. But that passage of scripture didn't just talk about you pray. That passage of scripture at least talks about three things you need to do whatsoever you desire when you pray. Believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Three things talked about. <laughs> but I come the only thing some people hear is believe that you receive. And I come the only thing people hear that I pass your scripture sometimes is you pray. How come the only thing people hear that I pass the scriptures you desire or no, you you gotta hear it all. The word of God says desire whatsoever things you desire. When you pray, believe that you received. Three operation of faith principles talked over, talked over there in Mark 11, 24. Got to bookmark that. But prior to Mark 11, 24, Yahushua says in Mark 11, 25, And if you stand praying, and if you hold anything against anyone, forgive, so that your heavenly Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. Oh, so Mark eleven twenty five, which has to do with repentance, has to come before Mark eleven twenty four and twenty three. Oh yeah, why? Because it's talking about repentance over there. If you have animosity against anybody, unforgiveness that Jesus is talking about over here is animosity. It's not talking about not fellowshipping with the Pharisees. After after all, Yahushua didn't fellowship with the Pharisees, and his prayers was answered. So the fact that you're not fellowshipping with the carnal and the unbelieving does not mean that you are in animosity. If you have odds against each other, odds means you are against a person. At the back of your heart, you have evil imaginations toward them. You don't wish them well. You're not walking the God kind of love toward them. Your prayers are not going to be answered. Mark 11, 25. So that's another critical, critical concept of faith, which we need a bookmark in the New Testament. If we are going to be operating complete operation of faith principles, just like God recommended. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, repent before you start praying. Uh oh, so with the evidence of these scriptures, we can identify at least four major categories, four major operations of faith. And it's going to start with Mark eleven twenty five. 25. If you actually want to do it in a chronological fashion, you're going to see repentance firstly, then desire the word, then pray the word, then believe the word. Oh, wow. I've never seen that before. That's the reason you didn't listen to the entire series that we're going to be starting with today. Faith of a preached. So he says, repent, desire the word, pray the word, and believe the word. Glory to God. And then another scripture in 2nd, 2nd Corinthians, in chapter 4, and in verse 13, now gives us insight into another principle of faith, which we need, we need to appreciate. 2nd Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 13 says, it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. 
So that verse of scripture links Mark 11, 24, 25 together with Joshua 1, 8, which we're going to be turning to next right now. But he identifies for us an additional principle over there we need to appreciate and imbibe into our operations if our faith operations will be holistic. Oh, what are you talking about? The principle 2 Corinthians 4, 13 identifies for us is confession. You got to speak the word of God, but you speak the word of God after you believe the word of God. Oh, but we know in Mark eleven twenty four 24, that he says you believe the word after you pray. And then after you believe, after you desire. And but then after you've repented of your sins. So we have repentance, desiring the word, or praying the word, believing the word, confessing the word. Five critical operations, cardinal operation of faith principles that God has identified for us through the scriptures. And the word of God says, after confessing the word of God, you got to meditate on it so you can do it based on the evidence of Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. So turn to Joshua chapter 1 right now. Please, by the grace of God, Joshua chapter 1. I'll take a look at that real quickly. God's trying to, in, trying to push Joshua to appreciate complete operation of faith principles right now. It says in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, Do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. For then you will be prosperous and successful, or you will have the glory of the Lord in your circumstances. Our destination with regards to operating like faith of a priest is to move in the direction of glory, honor, and immortality. But the Word of God says to you, the way you're going to get there is to make sure the book of the Lord does not depart out of your mouth. You meditate on it day and night. You seize opportunities to practice corresponding physical actions, which are going to tie up to everything summarized in the law. Then, then you will prosper. Then you will be successful. Then you will have the glory of the Lord in your circumstances. So the word does identify as far as right now additional principles which we need to appreciate. Confession, meditating, meditation, and doing the word of God or obeying corresponding physical actions. So between the evidence of Mark 11, 24, 25, 2 Corinthians 4, 13, and Joshua 1, 8, we can see a concatenation of faith principles which we need to imbibe in our operations as we grow up in the things of the Spirit. They are going to be repentance and loading, and you're going to appreciate the reason I'm putting loading in there when we see additional details in the tabernacle of Moses. But just take it from me right now. Repentance goes together with loading your spirit with spiritual energy. Repentance and loading the word, loading with spiritual energy, desiring the word, praying the word, believing the word, confessing the word, meditating the word, and doing the word. Those seven cardinal operations are really important. For you to master as you journey up and start to learn how to operate like a, like a priest of the New Testament. That's the reason we call this thing the faith of a priest. Is prayer going to be important? It is important. But so is desiring the word. So is repenting. So is believing. So is confession. So will be doing corresponding physical actions that God shows you based on the instructions you downloaded from the mercy seat. All these things are going to be important, especially in the season of gross darkness. When darkness covers the world and gross darkness to people. God's turning on the heat left, right, and center right now. You got to make sure you cross your T's and dot your hearts if you want to stand tall in the season of darkness. And shine with the glory of God on you. You don't want your testimony to be the testimony of the majority whose love will be waxing cold because of the season of darkness. Don't make that your testimony. Hallelujah. The word of God says the love of many will wax cold. But thank God Jesus didn't say the love of everybody is going to wax cold. So it means there is going to be a minority whose love will not wax cold. Who is that minority? Who will they be? These are the people operating complete exercise of faith principles and they are shining through the gross darkness of the world. The darker it is, the brighter they shine. The darker it is, the more brightly they're going to shine. Why? Because they are embracing these operations that God documented for us through the tabernacle of Moses. Bless the name of Jesus. Glory, 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 glory to Jesus. And as you are going to be seeing that all of these complete exercise of faith principles that I've documented over here, all of them are stated in the tabernacle of Moses by the grace of God. How did we find that out? We cried out to God for insight in this ministry and God started opening our eyes. 
And I've been on this study right now on this journey for close to 30 years. God woke me up in the middle of the night and confirmed through external sources that this is the way you should operate. As a little boy, 15 years old, 14 years old, and God started telling me that you need to start structuring your life right now after, after the tabernacle of Moses. And right after that, I can see external com confirmations of my circumstances. People start talking about it. And if you do a Google Google search right now, you type in the tabernacle of Moses, and you switch over to the images tab, you are going to see 3D displays and pictures of the tabernacle of Moses. God stirring off the hearts of people all over the world. There's something special about this tabernacle of Moses. You guys study about it. But just the fact that you have a 3D image of the tabernacle of Moses does not necessarily mean you are going to understand the spiritual implications of it. And some, some, and some gizmos are trying right now to go back back and build that temple, that physical temple. That, that's not what God is talking about. You, you should, it's important for you to appreciate those physical ceremonies so you can understand the spiritual implications of it. But you can build that physical, that physical tabernacle back and it's not going to feel the glory of God. And now their Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and burn it up for you. Because that's not what God is interested in. What God is interested in is the spiritual ceremonies that the tabernacle of Moses depicts for you. Glory to God. Why are we talking about all this tabernacle? You're just trying to get me confused, Mr. Land. No, that, I'm not trying to get you confused. I needed to appreciate that when you want to start operating in the advanced mode of Christianity right now, there are going to be additional details that you need to attach to your operation of faith. How do we know it's going to, that there's going to be an additional detail? How do I need to attach to my operation of faith? I've used two examples to actually answer that question all through the years, and I'm going to use those examples again by the grace of God. I'm going to ask you right now to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, talking about the example of Rahab and the example of Elijah. How Elijah's operation of faith contrasts with Rahab's operation of faith. We're going to see how it was documented in Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, glory to God. In verse 31, that Rahab, a prostitute, operated in faith. Well, <laughs> by faith. In verse 31, Hebrews 11, verse 31, says, By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. What? A prostitute operating in faith? What are you talking about? I can't believe that. Well, you sound like the Pharisees. I can't believe God's going God's to gonna induct a prostitute in the annals of faith warriors. We're talking about faith is just a special, classified for special people. But God says, Rahab operates on something we call faith over here. And God paired Rahab's operation together with the operation of people like Elijah who conquered kingdoms with the operation of faith in verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon. Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and other prophets who through faith conquer kingdoms and administer justice and gain what was promised, who shot the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose witnesses were turned into strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Elijah is going to be in this category over here because he conquered the kingdom of Baal back during the time of Ahab. And the word of God says Elijah operating in faith, the prophets operating in faith, and guess what? Rahab operating in faith as well. <laughs> but if you turn back to the Old Testament, you'll appreciate that Elijah's operation of faith principles was more tactical than Rahab's operation of faith principles. The word of God says, let me turn to it. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 18. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Let's do that Joshua thing with Rahab firstly. You know what happened concerning Rahab in the book of Joshua? How Rahab operated in faith by just hearing what the spies talked about in Joshua chapter 2. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Oh. In verse 17 of Joshua chapter 2, in the, 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 the Rahab, let's see what, what Rahab did right over here. 
Then the man said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on, binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down and unless you have brought your father and your mother and your brothers and all your family into the house. If anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in this house with you, his blood will be on our head if her hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we're doing, that we are going to be released from the oath, you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So, so she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. So what was Rahab's offers to face? So Rahab heard an instruction from the prophet of God. She believed that word. She confessed. She meditated. She did something about it. What did she do? Believe, confess, meditate, didn't do. That's what she did. The offers of faith principles. They told her, if you put this cloth over your door, when we see that cloth, we're not going to bother anybody. They're going to be safe. And Rahab saved herself and saved her family members just by listening and obeying what they told her to do. But when Elijah wanted to operate in faith principles, let's see what Elijah did in 1 Kings chapter 18 right now. Glory to God. 1 Kings chapter 18, just to let you know that there are details that goes into the operation of faith in addition to believe, confess, meditate, do. Rahab operated in the faith operations at the milk level. But Elijah started operating faith principles at the meat advanced Christian level right now. Let's see what Elijah did in 1 Kings chapter 18 and in verse 40. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. So they seized them and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face in between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked, and there is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, he chop your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black and clouds and the wind, uh, with, with clouds, the wind rose and a heavy rain came on and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Additional offers of faith principles. So when Elijah wanted to operate in faith, what did Elijah do? Elijah told Ahab, go ahead and make sure you celebrate over there. That's going to rain. But he didn't stop it there. He climbed up to the mountain and put his head in between his knees and started jamming the spiritual language to orchestrate circumstances to enforce what he said, which is the counsel of God. Rahab didn't do that, but Elijah did that. And both of them were documenting the handles of faith. Whoa. What's going on in there? Rahab didn't understand how to put her head in between her knees to generate spiritual energy to keep her family safe. Somebody did that on her behalf, but Elijah had to do that because he's right now a grown man. He's operating faith principles like a priest of the New Testament. So even though baby Christians may not be able to operate like the priests, of the New Testament, of a heavenly tabernacle, some people are going to do that for them. But as they grow up, God's going to be telling them, I need you to start contributing your quarter right now to the spiritual energy that has been used to keep you safe, the family, and your family members safe all the while. Learn from people like Elijah. Elijah talked his hand in between his knees. He started pushing on great amounts of personal denominators through travail and intercession. Pushing on great amounts of personal denominators. How do we know that? Jesus said in John chapter 7, Out of the bellies of those who believe shall flow forth rivers of living waters. Isaiah talked about it. As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her songs. Travail, intercession in the spirit. Elijah pushed it out. And God says, that's faith principles to conquer kingdoms. We taught Elijah how to do that. Oh, he thought he was born without wisdom. He wasn't born without wisdom. He learned it from the people who lived before him. 
People will live before him like Moses. People will live before him like Enoch. People will live before him like Adam. Somewhere, somehow, God taught those guys that if you want to push a great amount of personal dynamics, you need to understand the element of travail. And that's what he did. And when you are going to read through the details and the spiritual implications of what we're talking about today, you're going to see that that's actually documented all the while in the tabernacle of Moses. How do we know that? Follow along, you're going to see. So that scripture and those passages of scriptures are really important for you to, to bookmark to make you appreciate these studies we're talking about. The studies concerning Elijah, how Elijah's operation of faith principles will be at the meat stage. How Rahab's operation of faith principles will be at the milk stage because she's still a baby. She doesn't know any better. But Elijah's faith was patterned after the tabernacle of Moses, and he was able to tap into the glory of God as a result. The same thing as Yahushua, Jesus documented the book of Hebrews in the days of his flesh. He offered our prayers and supplications with strong cries and tears. Why did he do that? Rahab didn't have to do strong cries and tears every morning. The Word of God records concerning the experience of Jesus in the book of Luke. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Word of God says that he prayed earnestly and his sweats were like drops of blood. And some kings was arguing that, well, Jesus did that, so I didn't have to do that. <laughs> you know nothing about the God you serve, my brother. Come on, grow up. Jesus did that so he can show you what you need, what you need to do as you grow up. And we have people all through the annals of our history. Uh, people like uh, John G. Lake, uh, people like Father Nash and Charles Finney, Smith Wigglesworth. And some of us that God's raising up in this generation and trying to tap into uh, the secrets that, that these guys operate in. To stop pushing out great amounts of personal denominations. Pastor Luby Johnson, one of them, of course. And bringing clarity to our generation right now to understand how important it is for you to pray with all types of prayers. And some of us are trying to stretch the frontiers of revelation knowledge because we, we want the God of Elijah back in our generation. You want to see the kind of actions that Elijah operated in in the New Testament. You've got to understand the details that these guys operated in. Oh, but I don't know it. That's where we're asking you to study. That's where we're asking you to pray for revelation knowledge. That's where we're asking you to open your eyes and understand that the path of the righteous is like the light that shines brighter and brighter until the fullness of it. They cry out for insight. God, make me see. What do I need to do to get your glory? And when Elijah actually started this operation that we, we just read and referenced over here, you're going to see the first thing Elijah told the people is repair the altar. Oh, so he's trying to tell them there's going to be order to the way that you seek after God. There's going to be order to the way you want to pray right now. Then just come and dash into the most holy place and try to offer sacrifices. God's going to turn his eyes on you. Why? Because his eyes are too holy to behold iniquity. Huh. you got to understand the way your father operates. But he's my father and I just want to jump on his lap and communicate with him. No, you're covered with sin all over. you got to repent and put the blood of Jesus on you. And I understand certain things you need to do. Oh, yeah, but I'm coming, but you're coming to ask of me. Your prayers are not going to be answered because it's being prayed with the wrong kind of formula. There are spiritual mechanics involved in your daily operations. The Christians operate and understand it. Oh, wow. Uh, glory to God. This thing's getting me excited right now. So understand that as you grow up as a Christian, God's going to be inviting you right now to start adding additional details to the, to the way you operate. And if somebody were to challenge you, why are you trying to get technical? Point them to the example of Rahab and the example of Elijah that we just read over there. The example of Jesus as well in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 5. How come Jesus did that? How come Elijah did that? If they did, I'm going to learn about it because I want to have their kind of testimony. That, that guy lied me down. I, I can't wait to see that guy. He, he talked to certain things about God, to God's power. He was the only one, apart from Enoch, that God gave the experience of being raptured out of this planet before they died. He, he knew something about God. And I've seen certain things about his life and how he generated spiritual energy through travail, and putting himself in the posture of a woman trying to give birth to a baby or something like that. And you want to tell me I don't need to learn about what he did? You're kidding me. I'm going to learn about it. All right. 
So in the tabernacle of Moses, we are going to start delving into all these things and trying to appreciate the spiritual implications of these ceremonies. And as you study through the tabernacle of Moses, Exodus chapter 25, you are going to see that the tabernacle of Moses has three major compartments. There is a compartment that they call the courtyard. And I have a depiction on the board right now. If you've got your Google search, you can quickly type it, open it in another browser, and you are going to see that same depiction. Uh, lot, lots of depictions are arranged in a vertical fashion, but that's not really accurate because the tabernacle of Moses actually spans from west to east. And you're going to see all those dimensions over there later. So the tabernacle of Moses has a courtyard, or what you can call an outer court. Then he has a holy place right here. Bless the name of Jesus. And he has a most holy place. You need to appreciate that. In the courtyard, there are certain articles of worship over there, which we can call the brazen altar. And after the brazen altar, there is the brazen laver. After the brazen laver, there is going to be a veil that is called the outer veil. And at, when you pass through the first veil, you are going to see three major articles in what they call the holy place. This is the holy place right here. This is the holy place. This is the most holy place. You are going to see the holy place. You are going to see the table that, that holds the bread of his presence. Opposite that table, you are going to see on the south side the lamp or the candlestick. And as you journey westward, you are going to see the altar of incense. And then you are going to come through with another veil, which is this inner veil over here. After you cross through that inner veil, you are going to see the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant. Those are the major articles in the tabernacle of Moses. And God expects that you journey from the east toward the west, where the presence of the Lord is actually resident on the mercy seat. And God commands the people of Israel to do that twice a day. What are the spiritual implications of these things? We are going to try to delve into all of that all through this week. And we are going to start with the spiritual ceremonies of the courtyard. Or what you can call the outer court. What do they do in the courtyard? The first thing they do in the courtyard is the priest. Is the priest is going to put on his priestly robe, which has been sprinkled with the blood of ordination. Let's take a look at that in Exodus chapter 29. And in verse 21, bless the name of Jesus, they're going to wear this garment which has the ordination of blood on it. Exodus chapter 29 and in verse 21, glory, glory, glory to Jesus. It says, and take some of the blood on the altar and sprinkle, um, take some of the blood on the altar and some of the anointed oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments. And on his sons and their garments, then he and his sons and their garments will be consecrated. So there are special garments that they want to wear when they want to come into God's presence. That garment has the anointing oil on it, and he has the blood. He has the blood of ordination on it. What is the implication of that to the New Testament believers? New Testament believers should approach the presence of the Lord by the blood of Jesus. How do we know that? Well, I'm going to show you a New Testament scripture that something like that is still relevant to your testimony as a New Testament saint of God. Hebrews chapter 10. Glory to God. Thank God for the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10 still points us to the detail of the tabernacle of Moses. And I'm going to read it to you right now in Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse, oh, glory to God. God says, let me start from verse 19. All of it is good, but I'm going to start from verse 19. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Can you see right there? God says the very first thing you need to do is to come in through the blood of Jesus. And that takes place in the outer court, just like he took place in the outer court of the Old Testament, the tabernacle of Moses. And don't you let somebody tell you that the tabernacle of Moses and the spiritual import of it are completely done away with the Old Testament. You say, no, God, come over here and show us on the book of Hebrews. Why will God still make reference to the most holy place in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, if the tabernacle of Moses was forgotten with the Old Testament? Think about that. 
They're going to be saying all this tabernacle nonsense that Lionel Luda is talking about. And don't, don't mind that boy. He's, he's, he just, he's just lost his mind. No, no, no. <laughs> well, if you say I'm crazy, I thank, well, I, I, don't, I don't curse you for that. No, I thank you. I'm in a company of crazy people. They call Jesus crazy as well. They say he's lost his mind. Thank, thank you. Thank you for calling us crazy. But at the end of the day, you are going to see that we are going to start downloading the glory of God in our circumstances. And you are going to know that we're not crazy anymore. Because we're trying to teach you what will give you the, the, the manifestation of the presence of the Lord in, our, in your circumstances. You can open your heart and study along with us. Hebrews chapter 10 says, enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Why? It means the tabernacle of Moses is important. If there's a most holy place, it means there's a holy place. If there's a holy place, it means there's an outer core. And go back in the tabernacle of Moses and see the details over there. Enter by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way open for us through the curtain. That is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full of the assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. That's it right there. You got to come with your heart sprinkled to cleanse you from a, from a guilty conscience. You want to come into God's presence and you have guilt in your conscience because you just rebelled against God and you won't repent of it. God says, you, 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 can't, you can't come to the most holy place like that. I'm not talking about a physical most holy place. I'm talking about a spiritual most holy place. Cleanse your heart first in the blood of Jesus. That's what they did back in the Old Testament. And it's no surprise God's telling us the spiritual implication of wearing your garment of ordination right now with the blood of bulls and goats on it will be to put on the blood of Jesus to cleanse your conscience from dead works so that you can serve the living God. Which scripture says that again? Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 9. Bless the name of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 13 it says the blood of bulls and goats. And ashes of heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we can serve? Got a paper copy of the Bible? Please underline that particular phrase over there so that we can serve the living God. It means there is no service of the living God if your conscience is not clean and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You got to cleanse your conscience, the blood of Jesus, the word of God says over there. And that's what they do firstly, putting on that garment in the Old Testament. After they do that, they are going to bring incense spices from ingredients found after outside the tabernacle how do we know that exodus chapter 30 glory to god exodus chapter 30 and in verse 34 the lord said to moses take fragrant spices gum resin Onica, galbanum, pure frankincense, all in equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense, the work of a perfumer. It is to be salted and pure and sacred. Grind some of it in the powder and place it in front of the testimony. In the tents of the meeting, where I will meet with you, it shall be most holy to the Lord. God says the incense that you guys are going to try to offer when you get into the altar of incense over there, the spices that will make those incense bring them from the outer court. They do that as well here. What is the New Testament equivalent of that? Believers should approach the presence of the Lord with our spirits full of incense spices, which are going to be depictive of the ministries of Jesus, which we talked about in the milk section of the Word of God, if you remembered, when we talked about baptism into the Messiah. How do we know that you need to come in with your heart full of something? Let's turn back to the book of Hebrews that we just left off and you're going to see that God is not expecting you to come to God's presence with your heart empty. No, no, no. Your heart's going to be full of something. Let's take a look at it. Hebrews chapter 10. Once again, spiritual implications of the tabernacle of Moses. 
Glory, glory, glory to Jesus. But turn to it right now, real quickly. Hebrews chapter 10, once again, and in verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, and by the way, your invitation right now in the New Testament does not just stop at the holy place. It goes into the most holy place. In, in the Old Testament, they didn't have ready access to see God face to face in the most holy place except just once in a year. But right now in the New Testament, your invitation is not just to stop at the holy place. God's inviting you to come closer, come closer, come closer, come closer to the mercy seat. Come see me face to face every morning, every evening so I can download certain instructions to your heart that you are going to use to regulate aspects of your life and overcome the challenges of the next 24 hour period come closer to me notate that it says to enter the most holy, holy place by the blood of jesus by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body and since we have a great priest over the house of god let us draw near to god with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith underline that god says your heart's gonna be full of the assurance of faith. Why? Oh, that's what they did back in the Old Testament. Their censor had better not be empty. They got to fill that censor with something. They fill that censor with certain things they call spices back in the Old Testament. And we studied those spices back in the baptism of baptism into the Messiah message. Many of you will remember that. Which other scripture in the New Testament can we use to corroborate that? Go to, go to Ephesians chapter 3 right now. Your heart's got to be filled with something. And that thing, the Old Testament gives us further details into it. And John chapter 15 gives us further details into it. And it is spices or the ministries inside the heart of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse 16, it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may give you strength and power through his spirit in your inner being. Can you see that? Why is God talking about giving you strength? Now go to verse 20 real quickly. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, in accordance with the power that works within us. So you're going to be going to God to ask. You're going to be going to God to think about something. But the Bible says the way God's going to answer that prayer is if there is a power working within you. But where did you get that power from? Verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 3. It says, I pray that you be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. That your spirit full of the power of God. That your spirit full of the assurance of faith that God talked about in Hebrews chapter 10. And that's what they do in the Old Testament. Step number three. Priests then present animals as burnt offerings at the brazen altar in the outer court before proceeding to the brazen labor. So they're going to put on their garment right here, get their censer full of incense spices, then they march straight into the brazen altar. And what are they going to do? They're going to put animals on that brazen altar. They're going to put that sacrifice, that burnt offering over there. Hallelujah. What is the spiritual implication of that? Believers should present their bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God at the brazen altar, while their spirits and souls proceed to the holy place to offer up incense before the Lord. Which scripture says that? Romans chapter 12. God is letting us know the tabernacle of Moses is not done and over with. You guys open your heart and understand the spiritual imports of the ceremonies and start to download the glory of the Lord when you repair the altar. But I'm praying like this and I'm not seeing the glory of the Lord. That you're not praying according to pattern yet. There is something missing in your operations. Humble yourself and start asking God for light. When you do everything just like according to the pattern that God showed Moses in the mountain. God's not going to be a respecter of persons. He's going to fill your life with the glory of God. If God filled Moses' tabernacle with the glory of God, when Moses built everything according to the pattern that was shown him on the mountain, God's going to fill my life with his glory if I build according to pattern. If my life is not being filled with the glory of God after supposedly I've built according to the pattern, let God be true and everybody alive. I haven't built according to pattern. Humble myself and learn more. 
Mm. Glory to God. Romans chapter 12 and in verse 1 it says, Therefore I heard you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. And this is your spiritual act of worship. Bless the name of Jesus. So God is saying in here there is some kind of living sacrifices that God is expecting you to do in the New Testament. It says you offer your body. Oh, wow. In the Old Testament, they offer some kind of sacrifices. Well, this is the, 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 the bulls and the goats they're going to do over there. This is the place they used to do that, the brazen altar. They're going to kill that bull and put it over there. But in the New Testament, there is no bull to kill anymore. But you still need to present your body as a living sacrifice. What's going on in here? When you want to pray, you are going to have a prayer closet. You're going to say, my body, you're going to stay here disciplined as a living sacrifice while my spirit and my soul will journey out of my body to start talking to God. And when you start praying based on the structure, you'll understand that literally your spirit and your soul, soul are in communication with the Lord Almighty. Why? Because the invitation to the most holy place was not given to your body. The invitation to the most holy place was given to your hearts. What scripture says that? Hebrews chapter 10 again. Go back there. Whew, glory to God. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, my all-time classic. Thank God for the scripture in the New Testament. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full of the assurance of faith. So who is the invitation for he didn't say come near to God with a sincere body. No, it says with a sincere heart. Which your heart is going to be a collection of your spirit and your soul. Your mind, your will, your emotions, your recreated human spirit. God gives you an invitation. Come close to me in the most total place. But my body can throw tantrums and say, well, even though the invitation is given to my soul and my spirit right now, I just don't feel like praying. God says, now you discipline your body on the prison altar. You're telling your body to you stay right there. You're going to pray for the next one hour or whatever. Stay right there as a living sacrifice. You're not a dead sacrifice, but you are a sacrifice in the sense that you are going to wait here for me while I journey to run the holy place and I come back up and I pick you up and can do service outside the outer court. That's the spiritual implication of it. <laughs> glory to God. Woo! Glory to God. This gets me motivated. Man, I don't know about you guys. I'm ready to check out of here. Step number four. Priest then washes his hands and feet at the brazen laver. So they come through the brazen altar. The next thing they want to do is the brazen laver ceremony. What's this brazen laver like? The brazen laver, I want to ask you to read it later in the book of Exodus, is like a bronze-like material. It's a bronze-like material that they pour water into it. And we talked about it last week that it's a critical ceremony you need to appreciate so you can know how to identify water scriptures. So what they are going to do when they get to the brazen labor stage is they are going to start washing their hands in this basin, which is made of bronze, actually. And bronze is a material that can actually reflect something back to you real quickly. They can put water in there. They're washing their hands and washing their feet, washing their hands, washing their feet prior to journey into the holy place. You try to skip all the spiritual ceremonies. You come with a feel the hand or feel the hands and feel it, and then you feel the feet, and you're coming to the most holy place. God's going to blow you out. Go has the two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, back in the Old Testament. Now, we don't see God blow anybody out. That's because they're not praying based on the structure. But the, the, the veil that comes between you and your prayer will constitute a blockage to the answers you can receive. God's going to turn his eyes on you. Why? Because your hands are feeling. Your feet are feeling. What are we talking about? I thought Jesus said, feel the hands. And no, I'm not talking about feet, literal, literal hands and literal feet. What is the New Testament implication of washing your hands and your feet? We're going to see right now. Believers need to wash their minds, which will be representative of your hands in the Old Testament, and wash their wheels, which will be symbolic of the feet, with the water of the word of God, which will be the current status of Yahushua that you are trying to superimpose 
on the negative circumstances that you are trying to change in the to motion and in the fro motion. Because the priests of the Old Testament are going to wash their hands and their feet two times when they are journeying westward and when they are coming back journeying eastward. They're going to wash their hands two times. Go study it out in the Old Testament. How do we know that? That you got to wash your mind and your feet in the New Testament. Now turn to God says turn firstly to Psalm 24. Because Moses understood, no, David understood the spiritual import of the ceremonies of the tabernacle of Moses. And that's the reason God can call him a man after my own heart. He was from the tribe of Judah. They didn't open the doors of the temple to him. And yet he ascended to the holy place of the Lord every morning. How did he do that? See, Psalm 24. He says in verse 3, it says, Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to an idol? That's how we know that when you're talking about clean hands over there, it's talking about your heart, which will be a combination of your mind, your will, and your emotions. Oh, why can't you say that? Well, I'm going to show you another scripture. 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter talks about the same thing that before you come and pray, you got to wash some parts of you. How do you do that? 1 Peter 4 and verse 7. It says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. That's your praise and labor right there. So you're not just going to come and pray. Your mind's got to be clear. Your will has got to be self-controlled. Your emotions have got to have self-control in them. In other words, clean man, clean mind, and clean will. So that you can pray. Because where prayer actually takes place is the holy place toward the most holy place. But, but, but the Bible says before you get there, wash your mind, wash your will, wash your emotions. But how do we know that the will is going to be the feet? Huh? How do you know that? Well, back in the Old Testament, they are going to use their feet to journey toward the most old place. So the question you're going to ask yourself is, what part of you is going to carry you to the presence of the Lord? It's going to be your will. Why? Because God created you as a free moral agent. If you do not will to come closer to God, God's not going to force anybody to come closer to him. So it means your will has to be clean with regards to wanting to come closer to God. That's how we know your feet, which is going to carry you which are going to carry you to God's presence will be symbolic of the will part, the, the decision part of your soul. The will carries you to God's presence and it needs to be washed. You're not going to be having your will and the reason your feet is pluralized over there is because your will and your emotions are combined together. You come into God's presence with a willing heart and with a firm emotion. So you wash both members with the water of the word of God just like we talked about last week. How do you do that? You consider the gifts associated with doing things God's going to wash your wheel for you. They did that in the brace, at the brazen labor stage of the outer court. That spiritual ceremony is, is um, going to be equivalent to desiring the word that we read a few moments ago in Mark eleven twenty four as well. The word does whatsoever you desire when you pray. So it means before I pray, you got to desire something. Oh, wow, that's my will right there. So my will is going to be at the desire stage. I'm not just going to come and pray, pray without a desire in my heart. I'm not pregnant with anything. The word of God says in the book of Psalms that he who is pregnant with evil is going to conceive something. The same way he was pregnant with good is going to conceive something. Before there is, is going to give birth to something. He who conceives Something's going to give birth to something. Before there is a giving birth, there's got to be a conception. The desire stage is going to be the conception stage of your operation of faith principles. You're coming into God's presence. You don't have a desire. You don't have a picture of what you want to enforce in your mind. There is no hope before your faith. Of course, faith wouldn't work. You come into God's presence and say, well, what do you, what do you want God to do for you? Well, I don't know. I don't know what I want. Well, you're not going to get anything. <laughs> That's why it's important. Desire has to be clean, crystal clear. You know what you want to enforce for the next 24-hour period or whatever project you're working on. 
desire stage of the prison labor. Hallelujah. And then you wash your mind with the water of the word of God, considering the what aspect of the water of the word. You wash your will, considering the why, why aspect of the word of God. And when you are journeying toward the west, you are going to do that in the desire sense. Coming back, you are going to do, do that in the believing tense of it. And we are going to see how that works later by the grace of God. So, um, how, how do we put all this together? Come with the blood of Jesus, repent of any treason as needed, and get back in right standing before you pray. If you don't have any treason in your heart, acknowledge the sins and the frailties of our humanity, plead the blood of Jesus. Based on Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 13 to verse 14, 1 John chapter, nine, chapter 1 and verse 9, Remember to operate the repentance principles that we talked about in the milk stage of the Word of God. That is your undergarment. It's important. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interplay of God's move and man's move and God's move. Make sure nothing blocks your right standing if you want to serve as a priest of the heavenly tabernacle. That's repentance. Then afterwards, you want to, you want to load your spirit with incense spices which we talked about in baptism into the Messiah in the milk section of the Word of God. You're going to load your spirit with something we call Stactus Scriptures, Onika Scriptures, Galbanum Scriptures, Frankincense Scriptures. What are those Scriptures? Those are going to be prophetic Zoe Scriptures. It's equivalent to Stacti. Onika is going to be equivalent to Apostolic Scriptures. Galbanum is going to be equivalent to Pastoral and, Zoe and Teaching Scriptures teaching Zohar scriptures, frankincense will be equivalent to evangelistic Zohar scriptures. These are based on evidence of scriptures like Exodus chapter 30 to 34, John chapter 15, Luke chapter 4 verse 18, Isaiah chapter 61 from verse 1 to 6. Please listen to baptism and to the Messiah to refresh that understanding by the grace of God. One measure of incense spices will be a combination of these scriptures in equal amounts. So if you have one measure of statue, you're going to have one measure of anichor. You're going to have one measure of galbinum, one measure of frankincense. What does that mean? One measure of prophetic Zoe scriptures, one measure of apostolic Zoe scriptures, one measure of pastoral and teaching scriptures, one measure of evangelistic Zoe scriptures. Now you got a measure of incense spices in your heart. Then you go back, you get another measure of it. You go back and get another measure of it. How do you do that? From the promises of the Word of God. Where can I find that? You can find it on HeroesBarn.com. If you click on Zoe Scriptures over there, on the homepage of groceries, you are going to see Zoe Scriptures that you can use to reach out. And I think that needs to be updated a little bit. But if you're following along with us, we are going to send you this prayer book that has all those Zoe Scriptures packaged nicely to, together for you. That you can have measures of these kind of scriptures to remind you of the ministries of Jesus that you are to be pregnant with, that you are going to be praying based stuff as you journey to other most of the place. When you have when you have these spices in your heart, which are going to be representative of the ministries inside the heart of Yahushua, your prayers will come to God like a sweet smelling offering. How do we know that? Why? Because Jesus said He's making intercession for you. And his, his, his intercession on the right hand of the Father is oozing something that we can call spices or incense before the throne of God. And you're meant to be interceding right now from the earth if your prayers are going to be amplified with the incense that Yahushua is generating. Your prayer needs to resonate with the same formula inside the heart of Yahushua. Makes logical sense. That's the reason you've got to come with your spirit full of the ministries of Jesus. And that's the reason Jesus is going to say, if my words abide in you, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can ask whatever you will and it's going to be done to you. Oh, so the words of Jesus is going to be abiding in me. But I just thought that's the word of God. No, well, okay, it's the word of God, but technically he's talking about the ministries of Jesus. John chapter 50. So some people who may not remember what we talked about in baptism into the Messiah, turn please to John chapter 15 right now real quickly. Let's see that. Hallelujah. Huh. In 
In verse 7 it says, If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. So God's not saying if, if whatever you want to ask actually remains in you. No, no, no. He says, my words have to remain in you, that you can ask what you wish. You can ask what you desire, and it's going to be granted. But before then, my words have to remain in you. What does that mean? Yahushua's words. In other words, what Yahushua is pregnant with. What goes on the back of Jesus' mind every time. That needs to be resident on the inside of you so that you can ask what you wish and so it can be granted. What's resident inside Yahushua? Luke 4, 18. Isaiah chapter 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because it anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the broken heart, and recover your sight of the blind, declare the year of jubilee, and release the oppressed. Those four major ministries, prophetic, apostolic, uh, pastoral, and teaching together, and then evangelistic. Talked about in the Old Testament as well because we know that Statio, Nica, um, Galbenum, and all those things, they are largely spices that they get from certain resinous trees so they're going to go into a stacked tree and they're going to poke a hole in there something's going to flow out they're going to go into a galbanum tree and they'll poke a hole in there something's going to flow out they're going to go into into um a frankincense tree something's going to flow out and they're going to mix that together with a nica which is the shell of a mollusk that has been crushed for them we talked about all those details we can't go into all that all that right now but i need to remember that but that's the reason they do that ceremony back in the Old Testament. They are going to carry their censer filled with spices before they journey toward the most holy place to offer up incense before the Lord. So make sure your heart is full of the ministries of Jesus, which are going to be the Zoe spices that we're talking about to remind you of the ministries of Jesus. So you will not pray a mess. The word of God says somewhere else that you pray prayers and you do not receive the answers to your prayers because you're praying to meet. You're praying to gratify the desires of your flesh. And God said, well, this prayer is not, it's not spell, it's smelling right. Well, what's the formula over there? Oh, the formula over there is covetousness. Oh, the formula over there is the pride of love. I can't answer that prayer. Yahushua can't amplify that prayer because it's with the wrong kind of formula. Personal dynamics is not going to be generated. Wrong kind of formula. Come with the right kind of formula right in here. Load your spirit with the ministry of Jesus. Glory to God. So, so the next thing we want to do, of course, is present our bodies based on Romans 12, 1 to 2, which will involve you having a, a prayer closet. And dedicate two portions of your day for intense sessions of prayer. If you need to take a bath to keep yourself in awake or something like that, rub water on your eyes. Tell your body, you're going to stay here today. Present that body as a living sacrifice. When it, times to, when it comes time to pray intensely, God recommends pray like this in the morning and in the evening. What does that mean? Your morning necessarily does not necessarily ought to be the physical morning. It's a spiritual morning, which is... A portion of your 24-hour period that God has given you before the evil of the day. Darkness is going to be symbolic of evil. A time that you are going to be walking about the, 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 the busyness of the day without necessarily having time to spend with God. That spiritual night, that spiritual darkness. But God's going to give you a little slither of your day that you can come in a spiritual morning. That slither of your day, you do it with intense session of prayers and put your body down at a brazen altar as a living sacrifice and let your spirit journey up to talk to the Father of light. And download certain instructions that you are going to use to keep your baby safe, keep your family members safe, and download that increase to your business at the mercy seat. Living sacrifice. That's your spiritual morning. What about your spiritual evening? Your spiritual evening is going to be the time just shortly before darkness encroaches on you again. That's what they do at the twilight. They are going to offer up sacrifice like this. Go read it back in the book of Exodus. Oh, aren't you going to help us? No, go find it yourself. You're going to see that. They pray two times like this every day in the morning and in twilight. Two times. Spiritual morning, spiritual evening. Bless the name of Jesus. 
after darkness is over, before darkness encroaches your circumstances, seize these opportunities. And that's the reason I give you guys those two instructions. You exercise complete faith principles to enforce the kingdom of God for a 24-hour period. And after that, exercise complete faith principles to give you complete revelation knowledge. Those two critical baseline operations will keep you afloat in the season of darkness. Hallelujah. You're going to seek you first the kingdom of God and all things are going to be added unto you because you are right now like a priest of the heavenly tabernacle. Glory to God. So they do that. They present their bodies as living sacrifices, the brazen altar. And then they're, they're going to wash their, their minds, which are going to be their, their, their uh, wash their hands and their minds. What are you going to do? Pick a status of Yahushua that you want to superimpose on a negative circumstance. An example which I tell you to do, to use every day is to pray the kingdom through. Pray KJR to enforce KOG in your conference, to defeat the lost of the flesh, the lost of the highs, the pride of life, to make you walk in the God kind of love toward God, toward yourself, toward the people in your world. It's not just going to occur automatically that you don't have treason in your heart. There is a spirit of disobedience in the atmosphere who wants to cut your undergarment and jerk it away from you. What are you going to do to sustain the operation of perfect obedience, operation of faith principles? This is the victory that overcomes the world, even my faith. Without faith, you will be disobedience in the making. Which scriptures can I use to superimpose on the darkness of this world? Romans 6, 11. The word of God says, count yourself dead, indeed unseen. That's a water part of the word of God. You're going to use that scripture to wash your mind when you get to the brazen labor stage. The dead man is saying today, I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. Another scripture that corroborates that is Romans 6.14. Sin shall not have dominion over me. The tendency of treason. Rebelling against God and telling God yes when God says no. No when God says all this kind of tendencies and junk that will not have dominion over me. Why? Because Romans 6.14 says that. I want these scriptures superimposed on my mind, my will, and my emotions. Today, Father, help me in the desire stage. The word of God says that you are established in righteousness and free and far from all the pressures of the devil. Isaiah 54, 14 talks about that. The word of God says in Luke 12, 32, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What is this kingdom? Romans 14, 17, righteousness, peace, and joy. These are scriptures that you can use to wash your mind as you want a journey toward the most holy place to enforce the kingdom of God for your 24-hour period. KJR for KOG to give you AIM for POA. <laughs> what are you talking about? Milk out the word, brother. Go listen to it over there. You're going to understand POA is talking about the powers of agape. AIM is talking about agape emotions. And God paid motion will be the kingdom of God with simultaneous displays of kindness, justice, and righteousness in your circumstances and in your conducts to enforce the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy. That operation is what we call perfect obedience, and you will see the supernatural actions of your life to enforce the condition of perfect obedience when you generate spiritual energy to enforce that condition for a 24-hour period. Personalize these scriptures and use them in the desire mode before you pray. That's going to be in the two direction or the forward motion, the forward direction. Use these same scriptures in the believing mode, which is going to be in the fro or backward direction after you pray. So when you pray, God's going to give you additional details concerning the scriptures at the mercy seat. God's going to tell you, well, this is what I needed to do today to be established in righteousness and free and far from all oppression of death by the mercy seat. In your current circumstances, God's going to give you wisdom that certain things that should have taken you like two, three hours to do, God's going to tell you you can do this thing in less than 10 minutes. You, you take that nugget that God's given you, and when you journey backward toward the, toward the outer court, you get the brazen altar again, you are going to switch over right now to the believing mode. You're going to say, thank you, God, for this piece of instruction you've given me. I am established in righteousness right now. You're, not long, you're no longer going to be putting in the future tense that I want to be established in righteousness, which is what you do at a desire stage. 
But when you get to the believing stage, you are going to count it done. Thank you, Lord, and established in righteousness. You start journeying backwards to the outer court with a heart of thanksgiving, which the Old Testament priests did when they journeyed backward. They are going to remove that heavy garment of supplication and get into a lighter garment, which is representative of a heart of joy and thanksgiving, which is what you do as well as you journey backward toward the outer court. How do you wash your wheel? Consider the gains associated with realizing the status of Jesus that I may sustain the status of perfect obedience, for example, that I may be prosperous and successful in all my ways, that I may further the ministries in the heart of Yahushua. To walk in the God kind of love toward God and man and move in the direction of glory, honor, and immortality. When you start to conceal, why do I want to maintain the status of perfect obedience? Oh, so I can prosper in all I do. The word of God says if your obedience is not perfect, then you can't punish disobedience. Well, I won't punish the devil to kick his tail. It oh, shows up in my corner. I'm going to blast his tail out. Oh, wow. But I'm going to make sure my obedience is perfect. So he doesn't start, oh wow, that's why I didn't do that. You start thinking about the reasons associated with the current status of Jesus. You want to superimpose in your circumstances. That's going to wash your wheel for you. And when you think about that for a little bit, think about the gains and the losses, the whys and the why not. Say, well, come on now, boy, you, boy, you sit down there, I'm going to pray. I don't care how tired you're feeling like I'm going to rub water in my eyes right now. I've got to talk to the Father of life. Your will is washed. You got energy in your will. You, you're burdened with a burden. You want to go ahead and pray. That's the desire stage. And that completes the ceremonies in the outer court. And that's where I'm going to like to stop today. Next week, by the grace of God, we are going to talk about the spiritual ceremonies in the holy place. What do we talk about today? Faith of a priest, part one. The courtyard ceremonies. It's important for you to appreciate the spiritual implication of the tabernacle of Moses. The ceremony is thereof so you can learn how to download the glory of God in your circumstances. And God is not going to be a respecter of persons. If he did it for Moses back in the Old Testament, when Moses prayed like this, and he built his prayer lifestyle like this, in the Old Testament, the word of God says the glory of the Lord descended on that tabernacle. Well, in the New Testament, your body right now is the temple of the Lord. Your spirit is the temple of the Lord. Your life in total is the temple of the Lord. You need the glory of God in your life. You need the glory of God in your body. You need the glory of God in your spirit and circumstances. Well, the way you're going to do it is to, to, to go learn from Moses. Which Yahushua learned from Moses as well. He learned the spiritual implications of those things. Why? Because there is a heavenly tabernacle right now that you're serving as the priest of the New Testament. The word of God says it's called us to the kings and priests. Embrace the priestly aspect of your ministry so you can be a true king in Christ Jesus. My heart hurts when I see my brothers left, right, and center suffering from the oppressions that Jesus paid for on the cross of Calvary. And they are helpless and they can't lift their hands against the oppression. That depicts the situation of the time in Israel when there are no weapons of war. The enemy charges at you and encroaches in your circumstances and you can blast his tail off and God's deposit of certain resources in the word that you can learn and use to charge back on the devil. Return the battle to the gates when you start operating like a faith of a priest of the New Testament. Glory to God. We're putting the fighter in you today by the grace of God because you are a champion in Christ Jesus. You are a warrior in Christ Jesus. Uh, strengthen your feeble knees and raise up your drooping hands and say, no, I am going to operate like the priest of the New Testament so I can be a true king in Christ Jesus. Satan, you're not getting me anymore. You're not getting the members of my family anymore. How will I understand what it takes to add additional details to my faith operations and I'm coming out of the situation like gold in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Learn how to operate like the priest of the New Testament with faith of a priest. Part one. Today, by the grace of God. Amen. I would like to stop in here, and as my custom is, I want to give the viewing audience an opportunity to take a snapshot of the study notes on the board, and I'll be back after 10 seconds. All the glory to the name of Jesus. I believe you got a chance to take a copy of the study notes so you can study along with us. 
And if you can't really still see clearly after you've taken a picture of the study notes, this particular study note will be downloadable from heroesmart.com slash church. So you go to our website, you're going to see slash church, you can see what sermons over there. When you click on this particular sermon, the study notes are going to jump right in front of you and you can download it with a clear copy of it. And I want to thank you for staying on board with us. This is the meat section of the Word of God. It's really, really hard to understand, but I believe, I'm believing God with you that you are going to understand it because you've come through the milk section of the Word of God. you come through the pharmacy section of the Word of God. There is spiritual development right now. The Holy Spirit is going to give you further understanding. Pray to God. Say, God, what's Lana alluded talking about? Help me understand. It's going to make you, help you understand by the grace of God. Thanks for staying on board. You're a champion that God called you to be in Christ Jesus. You're a king. You're a priest in Christ Jesus. I'm believing God with you, my brother, my sister. Let's do business together for the kingdom of our God, the Father of light, in whom there's no shadow of turning, and the strength of Israel will not lie to you because he loves you. Be blessed in the name of Yahushua. Amen.